Hello, everyone. If you are welcome to our midweek Bible study, and it is the 14th um, of April, and it is 2021, and we are going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 2 with our study today, 2 Samuel chapter 2. And uh, we want to um, share some prayer requests with you. Um, if you haven't heard, um, Eric Hickman did go home to be with the Lord um, this past Sunday afternoon, and services for him will be at Stratford Evans a week from tomorrow, so be the 22nd of Thursday, uh, so, and that'll be uh, at 1030 at Stratford Evans, and there'll be information in the newspaper on that, and so um, um, just be praying for the family, pray for Josh and Alexis and for Ron. Josh and Alexis are his kids, Ron is his dad, and, and uh, Tiffany, and we just pray for that, that family for sure. Ron, uh, Don Clinton is home following his uh, quadruple bypass, but he's doing well. He's home and recovering, and, and it's going to be a, a tough recovery, but, but he's getting stronger every day, and so we want to keep him in prayer also. Also, we want to um, pray for Jo Marie George. She's a, up in Montana, and uh, she is dealing with also stage four cancer. And she had the first treatments last week, and uh, they went uh, as well as can be expected. Uh, but just continue to pray for her, and pray for Chris and the girls, and, and Jim and Jim and and uh, all of her siblings, and just the loved ones here in the church that that really care for her, and just pray that she would be. Uh, miraculously be able to recover from this. So let's pray. We'll get started. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for the scriptures and the words that will hopefully encourage us today. We do pray for Eric's family. We thank you, Lord, for the knowledge of his salvation, the knowledge that he is absent from the body, present with the Lord. We do want to pray, God, for uh, Don and his continued recovery. We want to pray, Lord, for uh, jo Marie, as she begins this uh, series of treatments, Lord, and we pray that her body would take to it and that, God, they would be able uh, to uh, alleviate this cancer, extend her life. And we just pray, Lord, for Chris and everyone else as they support her and encourage her. And we just pray for a miracle, Lord, that you would heal her completely. Bless our study. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, so we're in 2 Samuel chapter 2. Now, we have not been um, here for a couple of weeks. I thank you for your patience last week. Um, Liz and I celebrated our anniversary, and we just got, got out of town for a little bit. And so as we get back on it, um, just a reminder that, that Samuel, um, in Samuel, uh, Saul and his uh, three sons have died in battle, and David is now ready to come and be king. And um, he, at the end of chapter one, he laments for the loss of, of both Saul and uh, Jonathan, his, his friend. And so in verse one of chapter two, uh, David does something that shows that he is on a pretty good Plane. We've seen David kind of go up and down in his 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 life and his his kind of reactions towards things, and it says it happened that after this, after he laments for Saul, David inquired of the Lord, saying, "Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah?" And the Lord said to him, "Go up." David said, "Where shall I go up?" And he said, "To Hebron." So Hebron was a city just on the other side of where the Philistines were. It's a strategic city. It's kind of up on a hill and where he can, can look down, but he's not going right to Jerusalem. He's not going right to take rule uh, because he's still not ready to be accepted by the people. They're still um, kind of um, connected to Saul and they still see David uh, as a little bit of uh, on the other side of politics as we see today. So, but what David does here, which is very important, is he inquires of the Lord. And a couple of things to know here. One 
is that there were times where David did not inquire of the Lord. He acted kind of irrationally, kind of based on his emotions. Um, and now we see him kind of in a good spot. And this kind of happened after uh, God protected and, and saved his all the wives and children. And, and David is in a pretty good uh, mode of mind. And you are in a good mode in mind when you are inquiring of the Lord. The Bible says if anybody lacks wisdom, he ought to ask of God. The Bible says that we should seek first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto us. So we need to recognize that, that God is king, God is supreme. and His word is where we need to go to for answers and direction. It's the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. And David is in a good mode here because he is not just assuming what he's supposed to do. The other interesting thing here is we saw Saul towards the end of his life inquiring of God and God would not answer him. God had was kind of done with him. And if, if you are a born again believer and you go to the word um, seeking first the kingdom of God, you will find those answers. And that's important that, that the word of God is, is where you hear. Remember, Saul tried to get to God through a medium and going to find uh, Samuel who had died. And sometimes we turn to religion or we turn to Christian books or we turn to um, uh, people to get answers. Uh, and I'm telling you, turn to the word. Thy word is truth and seek the Lord first. Um, and so that's what he does. And, and God tells him to go to Hebron. And when David went there with his two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, Carmelite, verse 3, David brought up the men who were with him and every man with his household. So they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. Then the men of Judah came and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David saying the men of Jabez Gilead were the ones who buried Saul. So Judah, David's own tribe, the tribe of Christ actually, um, they are the first to, to recognize and accept David as God's anointed king. Now, what we're going to see later on, because we're going to have Saul, David, they were going to teach on Solomon, and then the kingdom's going to be divided between the northern and the southern kingdom. And we've already seen a little bit of that, um, but it's going to become... Um, uh, we've seen it as we've studied Sunday morning going through the Minor Prophets, that that southern kingdom uh, of, is called Judah because that's the one tribe that kind of stays connected to God's man. Um, and so the reminder here, I want you to think of Judah as the body of Christ. I want you to think of Judah as you, a, a believer and follower of Jesus, that even though the majority of the tribes, 10 out of the, the you know, other tribes, and not, not kind, of, kind of the Levites, um, who are kind of neutral in the whole thing, uh, they are following the wrong king. And the majority of this world is following the wrong God, the wrong truth, the wrong king of kings, relying on government, relying on man, relying on religion, and not relying on Christ. But you, you are set apart from this world when you align with the proper king, King Jesus and King of the kings and Lord of lords. Uh, but understand, very few recognize who the true king is. Uh, however, look at verse uh, five. I like this. David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead. Now, Jabesh Gilead, if you remember, they took the body of Saul and they kind of nailed it, and they, they took his head off, and they displayed it to ridicule him and mock him. And the people of Jabez Gilead came in and took that body and gave it a proper burial. And so David says to them, you are blessed of the Lord, for you have shown the kindness to your Lord, to Saul, and have burned 
have buried him. And now may the Lord show kindness and truth to you. Verse six is very important. May the Lord show kindness and truth to you. I will also repay your kindness because you have done this thing. So Judah is a picture of man recognizing the true king. And Jabesh Gilead is a picture of the true king recognizing those who do right. And verse six has played out in my life that by the grace of God, the Lord has shown kindness undeserved to me and has shown the truth to me. And so even the idea that I recognize Jesus as the true king, that is only through the kindness, grace, and mercy of God that my eyes have been opened to that. And so seeking first the kingdom of God, recognizing the true king, following the true king will result in love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, all those things undeservedly coming to us, the blessings of God uh, and, and, and overall resulting in life in heaven. Uh, and that's what we, we count on for, for Eric, that he is in heaven today, no longer in that cancer kind of ridden body and enjoying the fruit of the work of Christ in his life. Um, however, verse seven says, therefore, let your hands be strengthened and be valiant for your master Saul is dead and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. So he's showing his kindness to Jabez Gilead, but also leaves them with this, not warning, but, but it is kind of a, a warning that, that understand the person who you really are committed to is dead. And this is really what we're going to talk about in this chapter. It's, a, it's an interesting chapter in the fact that we are told in Romans 6, we'll read it a little bit later, that we are to reckon our old nature to be dead. And Saul is kind of a picture of that to me in this chapter. And David is a picture of new life. He's the new king. He's, the, he's the, the, the man after God's own heart. And Judah has aligned themselves correctly with God's spirit and the one who God has anointed. But the majority of the people do not. And we have to understand that Satan is relentless in attacking and devouring and sifting as wheat anybody he can. In verse 8, there's a guy named Abner. Abner is the son of Ner. He is the commander of Saul's army. Abner, if you remember, David at one time could have killed Saul and he didn't do it. And this wasn't in the cave. This was more out in the public. And um, he holds up the items that belong to Saul and he calls out, not Saul, but he calls out Abner saying, hey, you're supposed to protect this guy. You didn't do your job. So David and Abner have a little bit of a history already. David kind of uh, humiliated and mocked Abner. So Abner is going to do everything he can to keep Saul's reign going. Because if Saul's reign goes, then his reign goes. And he is a picture of taking politics and people over the prince of peace and, and the king of kings. And so what Abner does, the commander of Saul's army took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. So if you remember, the sons of Saul were killed, three. But now we find a son that we have not seen before. Now this could have been a son that was illegitimate. It could have been a son that maybe Saul wasn't even aware of or didn't want other people to be aware of, but it is someone that Abner is aware of. And he is able to take this, this man and put him kind of in a puppet kingship. Abner's really running the show, but he takes this Ishbosheth 
in verse 9, Ishbo, uh, verse 10, Ishbosheth, Saul, uh, verse 9, he made him king over Gilead, over the Asherites, over the Jezreel, over Ephraim, over Benjamin, over all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years. Only the house of Judah followed David. And the time of David was king in Hebron, was over the house of Judah, was seven years and six months. So the timetable is strange here. So seven years and six months, David reigned as king over Judah. Ishbosheth was only the king for two years. So apparently David had humbly following God's lead, uh, uh, kept kind of a low profile reigning there in Hebron. And then over the last couple of years, here comes, so it would have taken maybe four or five years for uh, Abner to put this whole thing together. And now we've got a divided kingdom, uh, even though Ispasteph is really never recognized as official king. It's, we, we look at the kings of, of, of Israel being Saul, David, Solomon, because those are the ones appointed by God. And so here is this relentless enemy. And David, because he's close to God here, has not been wearied by this, but chased by Saul, chased by Saul, run out of town with the Philistines, all the things that happened. And now Saul has died. So obviously now it's time for David to go and be king. But here comes the enemy again. It's, this reminds me a little bit of Elijah. If you remember Elijah, when he was able to defeat all the prophets of Baal. And then the next, and he was so bold and brave and, and almost in a mocking manner standing for, for God. But then comes um, Jezebel in the next chapter. And she vows to make sure David is, is dead before the sun goes down, so to speak. And or Elijah, I mean, and then Elijah gets so depressed he wants to die. And there's a verse in the Bible that says to be not weary in well-doing. And we have to understand that our enemy walks about like a roaring lion. He is relentless. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood and he will never stop. If we look out through the history of Israel. The enemy has tried to, to destroy them, has tried to uh, manipulate them, has tried to mock them. And it's been through the Babylonians, it's been through the Romans, it's been through the Nazi Germany, radical Islam throughout the history. The enemy, Satan, has used different people, different modes and different methods to just devour and sift all those who would follow God, relentless. And so here is David, finally getting rid of, of this Saul, and yet now he runs into Abner. And so if you get this, this idea, and, and I, I'm guilty of this, where you just, man, it's just, it's a fight every day. It's too hard. It's every day. It seems to be a battle. And the battle comes through, through family, comes through friends, comes through fellow Christians, it comes through the world. Uh, but Satan has a way of creeping in and trying to devour. So you've got to stay. The Bible says, be not weary in doing good. Understand he's always on the prowl and we got to wake up every day and put on the whole armor of God to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, because you'll have days like Elijah where you're on top of the world. And then the very next day where you just feel like I'm done, I'm too tired, don't want to do it anymore. Um, so verse 12 Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Manaim to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, sorry, the servants of David, went out and met him by the pool of Gibeon. So they sat down one on one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. So this is uh, David's nephews, and he is. Um, Joab, the leader of David's army. So now you have Abner, the leader of Saul's army, trying to keep Saul's reign alive through this Ishbosheth fellow. And he is face to face now 
with a civil war. Israelites on one side, Judah under Joab, Israelites on the other side, the rest under Abner. And they're face to face, and it is a battle for power. And they arose and went over. Uh, so verse 14, Abner says to Joab, let the young men arise and compete before us. And Joab said, let them arise. So we don't see here anybody inquiring of God. And so they have this great plan where they're going to have the young men fight it out. And whoever wins, that is going to be the victory. Well, here's the problem. There's a way that seems right to man, but the end of that way is death. The Bible says man's wisdom is foolishness to God. And because they don't inquire of God, I'm telling you, in our country, we have lots of issues, lots of issues, and lots of divide. But the problem is, unless you seek God and inquire of the Lord on what to do about the virus or what to do about racial tension or what to do about violence in the streets or what to do about uh, violent police officers or what to do about crime or what to do about economy or what to do about the border or what to do about any issues in this country and you don't inquire of God, you're just never going to find the answers. And their answer was, hey, let's just let these guys fight it out. Well, let's see how this works. So they arose in verse 15 and went over by number 12 from Benjamin, follower of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and 12 of the servants of David. So that's what we'll do. We'll take our 12 best guys and your 12 best guys, and they'll fight it out. Each one grasped his opponent by the head, thrust his sword into the opponent's side, so they fell down together. Therefore, the place was called the Field of Sharp Swords, which is in Gibeon. Great fight. So 12 on 12, and when they said go, everyone immediately grabbed the back of the head of their opponent, shoved the sword in them at the same time, and all 24 of them just fall dead, accomplished nothing. And that is such a perfect picture to me of the wisdom of man. It just leads to death. There's a way that seems right to man, but the end of it is death. And when we are running this country through the wisdom of man, then we are going to see the death of our economy, the death of our morals, the death of God's blessings, and the death of the United States as we know it. Because we too much is given much is required we have experienced the blessings of god in this nation when we proclaimed ourselves to be one nation under god and when our uh, constitutional laws are written according to the morals of scripture we had blessings abundantly god says uh, when concerning israel I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee we don't even begin to know and realize the blessings we have because of our alliance with God's people. All of that's going to be lost. And the, the result is going to be the death of the democracy, freedom, and blessings that we've had in this country. And we as a church, we as the body of Christ, we'll just keep preaching the gospel through it. It won't be as easy. It'll be much harder. But as we've seen with David, choir of God and keep preaching. So this didn't work out very well. So in verse 18, the three sons of Zeruiah were there, Joab, Abishai, and Asael. And Joab um, and Asael was as, Asael was as fleet footed as a wild gazelle. So this guy had a gift. And the gift was his speed. He was very fast, fleet-footed. Not much of a fighter, but he was fleet-footed. And he was the brother of Joab. So Asael pursued Abner. And in going, he did not turn to the right or to the left from following Abner. Abner looked behind him and said, are you Asael? He answered, I am. And Abner said to him, turn aside to your right hand or to your left. Lay hold of one of the young men and take his armor. For yourself, but Asael would not turn aside from following him. So Asael's running after Abner, the head of the army of Saul. And he's going to catch him because he's very fast. But Abner also knows that he's going to kill him. He can fight with him. Um, 
So if he catches them, it's, it's kind of like not somebody you want to catch. And he, he doesn't want to kill them because he knows that's going to create anger in his brother. And so he tells them, go left and take somebody else's armor. So this kind of notes that maybe Asael's purpose is to be the hero. I'm going to go after their main guy. I'm going to kill him and take his armor. The problem is, once he catches him, he's going to lose this fight. So Abner says again in verse 22, turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I face your brother Joab? However, he refused to turn aside. Therefore, Abner struck him in the stomach with the blunt end of the spear um, so that the spear came out his back. He fell to the ground and died on the spot. So it was that as many as came to the place where Asael fell down and died stood still. So he, he hits him with the blunt side of this. So it almost sounds like he, he didn't really want to kill him. He didn't stab him with the sharp side. He hit the blunt side, maybe to stop him, but he was going so fast, it, it went through, hopped to his back and he died. And now there's a huge problem. The problem is the brother of Joab is dead and the people stand still. Joab and Abishai also pursued, these are the other two brothers of Asael, and they kept pursuing until the sun was going down. When they came to the hill of Amma, which is before Gila, by the road of the wilderness of Gibeon, and the children of Benjamin gathered together behind Abner, and they became a unit and took their stand on top of the hill. So here's Abner with all of his soldiers now that are left, stand on top of this hill. And Abner called to Joab and said, shall the sword devour forever? Do you not know that it will be bitter in the latter end? How long will it be until you tell the people to return from pursuing their brethren? So Abner is calling for peace. He says, man, Joab, are we going to fight forever? Are we going to just kill your own brethren? And, and I'm going to take this a, a, a little place, and, and I hope I'm, I'm on target here. And I did some research and reading to, to try to make sure that we're on track here. Um, Joab says to him in verse 27, unless you had spoken, surely then by morning, all the people would have given up pursuing their brethren. So unless you had spoken, we would have kept going. And Joab blew a trumpet and all the people stood still and did not pursue Israel anymore, nor did they fight anymore. So that kind of sounds good. Oh, there is peace. But you have to understand that Abner represents the enemy. And in this particular spiritual aspect of it, who is our enemy? Now, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, uh, but we wrestle against principalities, rulers of darkness. And we're to put on the whole armor of God to stand against the wiles of the devil. And when you stop the spiritual fight, it is not a good thing. We have to, the Bible says, and when, when Apostle Paul died, he says he fought the good fight, finished the race. The fight is never going to be, he is going to relentlessly pursue us. So we must relentlessly pursue righteousness, relentlessly pursue a God so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. Well, because look at what it says next in verse 29. Abner and his men went on that night through the plain, crossed the Jordan, went through the Bithron and came to Mahanaim. So Joab returned from pursuing Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there were missing of David's servants, 19 men, and Asael. So they lost 20 men in this battle. But the servants of David had struck down of Benjamin, Abner's men, 360. So you can see now why Abner probably wanted this fight to end. They had lost 360, 
David's men had lost 20. So it makes you wonder, had they just pursued this, this fight, could they have ended this conflict between the two once and for all? Because look what it says next. Then they took up Asael, buried him in the father's tomb. Uh, well, let's go. Um, then they took up Asael, buried him in his father's tomb, which was on Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night until they came to Hebron at daybreak. But look at chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. So not pursuing them did not stop the relentlessness of the enemy. And I, I want to say this, that in our, our modern culture, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter uh, 7. There, there is almost a call of Christians to kind of back off that part of being a unified country would be to take the gospel and, and not offend people with it. Uh, the Bible says in Luke that Jesus divides is within a home, that five would live in a home, but, but they would be turned against each other because the gospel is offensive to people. Marvel not that the world hates you. And sometimes for the sake of peace, we back off. And, and I think in this particular case, Joab may have been better served as they were winning this battle, even though Abner had his, his army with him to pursue and finish the, and not stop fighting. Now, whether that's in context or not, the, the concept of fighting and the, the war between the enemy, which is Satan and our flesh, is constant. Look at Romans 7, and uh, let's go ahead and look at verse 15. Romans 7, 15, Paul speaking says, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I want to do, I do not practice it. But what I hate to do, that I do. If then I agree that what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it's good. So he says that I have these things I don't want to do that I do. Uh, let's, let's call it a temper tantrum. And, and Paul says, I, I keep doing it. But the fact that I, it bothers me, I agree the law is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, verse 17, but the sin that dwells in me, Romans 7. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For it is to, for it to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I don't find. For the good that I will to do, I don't do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. So he's just saying the things I don't want to do, I end up doing. And if you're a Christian, you understand this concept that, that our, our body lets us down sometimes. Our flesh lets us down. So verse 20 says, now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So verse 21, I find in the law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So he talks about a war. In this war of the flesh and the spirit, you cannot back down from it. You can't have a bad day. Uh, bad days lead to, to bad decisions that lead to consequences that affect the rest of your life. That day that you cheat on your spouse or that day that you steal money from your job or that day that you lose a temper and lose your job or that day that you, you do something violent against another human being. Uh, the day that you say that inappropriate thing on the internet because you're trying to blow off steam and you have that reputation. Uh, that, that is something that we have to battle every day. And you can't just back off from the fight because as we saw, the fight raged on for years and years and years. Well, maybe if Joab 
would have just pursued him that day, it would have been over. He says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ. So then with the mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He says, you know what? But thank God I have Jesus Christ who died for my sins, washed him away, put him as far as the east is from the west. And I thank God that I'm going to serve God with what I know is right and not work on my emotions. And if you don't understand that your heart is deceitful above all things and that you must serve God with the law of your mind, we often say those things. I know I'm supposed to do this, but my heart leads to do things I shouldn't do. So how's this battle work? Well, here was the problem. Joab, by not pursuing Abner and eliminating him once and for all, it became a constant battle all the way through this divided kingdom. Look, if you will, at Romans 6. And Romans 6 talks about the baptism of our old man, the death of our old man. And it says in verse 6, knowing this, Romans 6, 6, that our old man, that sin nature, was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. And if we died with Christ, we believe that we should also live him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, and death no longer has dominion. Look at verse 11. Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive in Christ. You have to completely reckon that old man to be dead. Baptism is the picture of you being that old person, that old sin nature in which sin ruled and had dominion over you. But that old man was crucified in Christ and buried with him. And now we are raised to walk in newness of life. And so the idea is that if you don't pursue that old man as dead, but you leave him alive by living in the flesh, by watching things in the flesh, by not going to church, not reading your Bible, not spending time in prayer, that old man is resurrected from the dead and you haven't pursued him and taken care of him. So we have got to repent, turn from those old ways and pursue a relationship with Christ that is a life of righteousness, a life of, of freedom from sin. And God puts the language better than I can. Reckon yourself to be dead. Crucify that old man. Don't stop right at the precipice of victory and leave that sinful nature alive through taking part in these sinful activities. So that's what we get kind of from that second Timothy is, is that we want to uh, inquire of God when we have a need. We want to recognize who the true king is and when you do that, he'll recognize who his true followers are. And finally, in this spiritual war, we do not want to stop short and grow weary. We want to pursue righteousness. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this lesson. We thank you for the blessings you've given us. We ask you, God, to help us to continue to not grow weary in the battle ahead of us, Lord, between not only the enemy, the principalities, the rulers of darkness, but Lord, also between our flesh and our spirit. Uh, bless this lesson in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great night. A live service, 10 o'clock on Sunday, 7 o'clock on Wednesday night, and be blessed.